Okay, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, start today Men's Health uh, Club meeting, which is conducted for the first time through a live webinar. We are honored of having two eminent international speakers who will share with us their experience during this pandemic period. By the end of this meeting, we will have more insights when it comes to uh, managing your practice and uh, how to select your patients, how to protect yourself, and in turn, how to protect your family. This meeting will not happen if we don't have a, uh, an excellent collaboration from our uh, strategic partner, Tabuk Pharmaceuticals. So I would like to extend my special thanks to the management and the people supporting uh, this meeting. It's with honor to introduce our speakers. The uh, first speaker is Dr. John Malal, very well known to most of us, professor of urology at Cornell University. He's a director of, the director of male sexual and reproductive medicine program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Center at New York. He's also the editor-in-chief for the Journal of Sexual Medicine. He's the past president of uh, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America. Dr. Mulhall is a well-known expert in urology and andrology, has more than 270 scientific publications, and a well-known speaker at a local and international meeting. So uh, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation, Dr. Mulhall. It's my pleasure. Um, our uh, second speaker is Professor uh, Henrik Lido, uh, Professor of Urology and uh, Surgery at Faculty of Medicine, uh, Compultantes uh, University in Madrid, is the Head of Urology and Urethrogenital Reconstructive Surgery and Men's Health of Urology Service at the General University Hospital in Madrid. A well-known also expert in urology and andrology and reconstructive surgeon, he published more than 100 scientific publications and a well-known speaker at local and international meetings. So thank you for joining us, uh, Enrique. Thank you so much. It's so my pleasure. We a meeting by having some background on the situation. The top two countries in the world who have registered for or have a clear record of uh, COVID-19 affected patients. We're talking about USA and Spain, according to the latest uh, consensus or statistics. I would, uh, I would ask Dr. John Mulhall to just elaborate on the situation now in the state, in the New York and in his, in his local hospital. Okay. You want me to talk about the state and uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering first? Yeah, I'll do both then, good. Um, okay, let me know if you can uh, see my screen. <clears throat> yes. Can you see my yes, screen? Well, perfect. Okay. Well, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, to be here. I have uh, a very soft place in my heart for uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and uh, Saleh bin Saleh's organization. So it's my pleasure to do this. Um, so let me just see. Yeah. So um, first of all, my disclosures, I have zero industry relationships um, to declare to you. Uh, I'm a specialist in sexual and reproductive medicine, as uh, Dr. Pinsali has said. Uh, I'm not a COVID-19 expert, but I am living in New York and I work in New York and I work at a major medical center, which has been heavily impacted uh, by the COVID-19 uh, experience. Um, in doing a little research for this, uh, the nomenclature is very interesting. Uh, the uh, name COVID-19 was announced only on the 20th of February of this year, and uh, the coronavirus disease or COVID-19 is the disease, but the virus is the SARS uh, coronavirus 2, uh, which is very closely genetically related to the SARS virus from 2003. Um, it spread through droplets, uh, through any aerosolization and it's some very interesting research if you go online and look at speech as a means of um, causing droplet formation 
you'll see that um, even just speaking quietly causes aerosols to disperse into the air. What's also very interesting is that it's clear now that it also spreads on surfaces, uh, metals and hard surfaces more than wood or cardboard. Uh, and it can remain on those surfaces for up to 72 hours. The particle is uh, 0 0.01 millimeters in size. And if you're wearing an N95 mask, um, they will block um, uh, particles um, uh, up to 0 0.03. So the particle can technically get through an N95 mask um, if you're wearing one. Uh, from a symptom and sign standpoint, the time from inoculation to the sign of symptoms is uh, anywhere from 2 to 14 days with a mean of about 5 days, according to the CDC in the United States of America, the Centers for Disease Control. What's most concerning, and I think which has been grossly underappreciated by uh, health authorities, uh, is the concept of pre-symptomatic transmission. And so 25% of people who are um, uh, have active COVID may have no or minimal symptoms. and so have been out in the community transmitting uh, coronavirus to other people. Uh, the classic symptoms are classic viremia symptoms, uh, fevers, uh, muscle aches, and generally a dry cough, but there are some other uh, interesting symptoms which I'll talk about in a minute. High fevers, generally long-lasting, um, five, uh, six days worth of high fevers. Abdominal pain and nausea is not a common symptom, but some of our patients at Memorial have presented with these very symptoms. I think you're probably aware of the concept of anosmia, which is now recognized as a telltale sign. If somebody presents with new onset anosmia, uh, then we have to think very seriously about uh, COVID-19. There's some very other interesting manifestations such as cognitive dysfunction, uh, disorientation, poor concentration, um, and there have been several case reports now in the New England Journal of Medicine of uh, COVID-19 being into Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, of course, it's a uh, real problem is uh, the development of a very recalcitrant and very difficult to treat pneumonia. Um, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome is really the final common pathway to, to death. However, there are two distinct phenotypes, a low compliance and a high compliance phenotype. And the low compliance phenotype end up on uh, a ventilator and are actually very difficult to manage uh, from a ventilatory standpoint with very high FiO2s and very high PEEP. Uh, pressures. The other um, phenotype are patients who have actually good preservation of compliance, but they have a high ventilation uh, perfusion mismatch, almost like a large pulmonary embolus. Uh, and these are the patients who can be managed outside of the intensive care unit uh, with this concept uh, I think you're probably now hearing about called proning, where they're kept on their, um, on their chest uh, and they can be managed without a ventilatory support, but high O2 intake. Very interestingly, it's clear already, uh, as it was with the SARS virus in 2003, that the mortality among males is significantly higher than among females. Uh, this is just a, uh, a diagrammatic representation. If you look on the right-hand side, you'll see some interesting, uh, interesting symptoms uh, in severe disease, difficulty waking, confusion, um, uh, hemoptysis, uh, of course, uh, reduction in white blood cell count, kidney failure, um, and then some of the uh, neurological symptoms that I talked about before, and anosmia. So the chronology is very interesting. It started in Wuhan, China in December 2019. As far as we know, exactly when it started uh, is not clear, um, to be honest with you. And there are, of course, some concerns that the information was suppressed initially by uh, the Chinese government. The source appears to be bats uh, and perhaps pangolins uh, in these wet markets. I think you're aware of the concept of wet markets where live animals are sold and, and killed and, um, and uh, they are at risk of carrying viruses. There's an 80% overlap between the bat um, uh, SARS virus and the human SARS virus. WO declared a public health emergency of international concern on the 30th of January 2020, and they declared a pandemic only a month and a half later on the 11th of March, and it's not clear to me why that was. I'm sure there are definitions that need to be uh, fulfilled before you can call it a pandemic. As of the 18th of April, yesterday, there were more than 2.25 million cases identified in 210 countries in the world with more than 154,000 deaths. And of course, we've not seen the end, end of the cases or the deaths yet. From a testing standpoint, the standard test, and I have had a test and it's negative, uh, is a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, however, you could do bronchoalveolar vas if somebody was having a bronchoscopy, and then of course there's a serum antigen test, 
Um, it's very, very clear to me, uh, we've had uh, a couple of cases among fellows at Memorial Sloan Kettering, that the initial test was negative and the patient was persistently symptomatic and had a second test done and the second test was positive. Probably the most accurate test is to have a serum antigen test using an RT-PCR, um, which is um, more expensive and more complicated to set up. Uh, the uh, nasopharyngeal swab is very easy and literally takes about 15 seconds to do. Um, there's some literature accumulating on the role of chest CT scan looking at the kind of pneumonia, and this has, at this point in time, not been recommended by the American College of Radiology. Uh, this is a statement from Michael Levitt, who was the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services in 2007, so 13 years ago. Everything we do before a pandemic will seem alarmist, and everything we do after it will seem inadequate, and I think we're realizing this experience now. So let's talk about COVID in America, and the first thing you need to understand is the structure of the American government, which has really interfered with um, our response. Okay, it hasn't helped, it's actually interfered. We are a federal government, we have a president, and he is in control, he's the commander in chief, and under him is the CDC. Uh, the number one public health authority in America is the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. We have 50 states and several territories. The states have governors, and each state has a state department of health. And then there are mayors of major cities. Let's say, take, for example, New York City, which has a very powerful mayor. New York has a governor. But New York City has its own department of health also. And then there are local authorities. So there is this chain of command which causes um, uh, non-uniform response. This is the rise in COVID-19 in the United States of America. And uh, so we knew about um, COVID-19, uh, at least from China, in the earliest part of January, which is on the far left-hand side of the x-axis. And you can see the growth in the COVID-19 cases starting in uh, middle of March here. So we had about two months in which to prepare and respond, but during which time there was very poor and very slow response. And here are the errors that occurred in our country, and hopefully they won't occur in other places. Uh, we had up until last year a team, pandemic response team, which was disbanded uh, by the president of the United States, Donald Trump, and it's not clear what the motivation was for that. They had a pandemic playbook they had spent years since uh, Ebola virus in 2014 and, and since SARS in 2003, they had a playbook that if followed would have set things in place and things would have happened much more quickly. And that has not been adhered to by the current, current government. So there was a significant delay in addressing COVID-19. There was an early denial of the significance and magnitude of the problem and it's unclear to healthcare practitioners uh, why that was. This is uh, our president standing up and saying it's not an issue. But this was clearly driven by two things. It was clearly driven by politics, and it was definitely driven by economics. There was tremendous fear here in the United States of America that um, calling this a pandemic and a pandemic response would interfere with the economy. And of course, our current president, his number one positive thing that he's done uh, for this nation in the last three years has been the economy. So tremendous fear among the government about a drop in the economic parameters. There's been a tremendous absence of uniformity in response from state to state. I'll show you an indication of that in a minute. There's been an absence of available testing. So really for the first two to four weeks in the United States, there was almost no testing done, okay, because of the absence of tests. And likewise, there was an absence of adequate um, personal protective equipment for practitioners. And I think you're probably all aware and have seen many instances of healthcare workers at institutions coming out in public and saying I've been made to wear my N95 mask for five days in a row and it's dirty and because ultimately there was just not enough PPE and of course it's incredible to think that one of the most powerful and wealthy countries in the world would not have some stockpile of PPE in preparation for a pandemic but that is the reality and that is why we are basically the epicenter um, uh, of the world. Um, I'm not uh, uh, political in any means, I'm actually a centrist, so I'm neither a Democrat or a, a Republican, but I do want to show you as a timeline what was being said by our uh, government, our president in particular, uh, all the way from January all the way up to March 
Um, and this was, uh, he was claiming that this was a political hoax. And of course, he changed his uh, tune uh, within, uh, within a month of that with the very high skyrocketing number of cases and death rates in the country. And this, th this attitude and this response just delayed good medical response to a situation that I think could have resulted in far less deaths in this country. I want to give you an example of the United States of America. There are 50 states. These are the states in alphabetical order. Those yellow states are the ones who declared stay-at-home orders called shelter-in-place uh, very early on. California, Illinois, New Jersey, and New York. Okay, The ones who are, in, are listed in red are the ones who are the slowest. Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Nevada. I'm going to indicate for you, I'm sure you don't know this, there's one very, very distinct difference between the yellow and the red. The yellow states are run by Democratic governors who are not listening to the President of the United States. And the red were run by Republican governors. So Donald Trump is a Republican and they were listening to the President of the United States. Even the earliest, March 19th, which is California, uh, was two months after the uh, realization that this was a real problem in China. So we were even in the best states, we were slow. Uh, just to put things in perspective from an international standpoint, I'm from Ireland originally. I'm a very proud Irish man who's lived in America for 30 years. But the pubs in Ireland were closed 36 hours before St. Patrick's Day, the biggest drinking day in, the, in Ireland in the entire year. 365 days, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day is the biggest day for alcoholic drinking, alcohol drinking in the United States. And this indicated the seriousness with which Ireland were taking this uh, in the middle of March, well before the United States took it very seriously. So the strategies for social strategies for COVID-19 that are being communicated by the CDC and Departments of Health in America and things that you and your family can do look on paper to be very simple. Look on paper to be very simple. The first of, uh, of which is hand washing. OK, As surgeons, uh, I think we're all very familiar with the concept of hand washing. Um, or using a, a disinfectant, hand sanitizer. When this started, when things started being taken very seriously in the middle to the end of March, there was a shortage of two things in the United States of America. Toilet paper, number one, and hand sanitizer, because it was panic buying. Social distancing is the concept that you must stay more than six feet away from any other individual. Okay, And that's very difficult to practice in medicine if you have to examine somebody urgently, and uh, hopefully you would be wearing personal protective equipment if you are in, in an emergency room or an ICU or in your clinic uh, with an emergency patient. Social isolation uh, is a further step of distancing where people are encouraged just to stay home and to go out only for absolute necessities, which is grocery shopping or collecting medications. And now wearing masks in external environments. And each of these has had a progression in time. Hand washing was the first thing, then social distancing in March, social isolation in early uh, April. And now in New York City, New York State, the governor two days ago said, everyone who is in an external environment needs to wear a mask. It doesn't specify what kind of mask, but everyone has to wear a mask and you will be fined and potentially arrested if you do not have a mask in place. That is only two days ago or well past uh, the peak. And this is just a diagrammatic representation of the power of social distancing. Okay? Um, if you look at the, um, on the internet and listen to uh, aerosol engineers and aerosol scientists, this two meter rule, they will say drives them crazy because it's probably too close. And if you look at the aerosol uh, experiments that are being done from China actually, where people just speak, and where the, how far the aerosol goes, uh, two meters is probably not enough. So this was a perspective from the New England Journal that was published on April 2nd. And I just want you to read on the bottom left-hand side of this slide, okay? I think you and me, as a scientist, would agree. The problem is the politicians haven't listened. When epidemiologists warn that a pathogen has pandemic potential, the time to fly the flag of freedom is over. So freedom in the United States of America, which is not the same as in China, okay, where they can lock their country down, but freedom in America is prized. okay. 
and people are very resistant to being told what they can and what they cannot do. And that has been lethal to the pandemic response. People have just not been taken seriously. And when we say social isolation, social distancing, it is still incredible how many people are not doing this. For example, a month ago, the governor of Florida in the, uh, on that steep rise in the curve of the people who were getting uh, COVID-19 and dying from COVID-19, allow the beaches to remain open. Okay, just an absolutely um, incredible decision for healthcare practitioners, because of course, that is a mass gathering, and consequently, many people have got COVID-19 who were attending those beaches in Florida. And those people who were attending the beaches were from all over the United States. They were not just Floridians, they were from all over the United States. If you just look some data at the bottom of the slide here, this comes from Johns Hopkins, who have a control center, command center, who are monitoring this internationally. You'll see the date is March 16th, and you'll see China very high. What I want to point out to you here on the slide are these three groups, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. And what differentiates those from every other country on the slide, on this slide, is the concept of lockdown. Early social distancing, social isolation, wearing PPE are the three maneuvers that they put in place immediately. And you can see that their rates are lower and then their death rates are also lower. Uh, this is looking at country by country and this is looking um, a little later, March 20th. And you can start to see that the United States of America is starting to accelerate and Enrique here's Spain. So US was below Spain, but was catching up very, very steep curve in the United States of America. If you look at deaths in Italy and Spain, this is again March 16th, you can see significant number of deaths, China high deaths, Japan and South Korea not so much, but America on March 16th um, rising uh, rapidly. This is just the states. In the United States of America, the first case was in a um, was an employee of a nursing home, a convalescent home, in Washington State, in Seattle, in the Seattle area. And many of the inhabitants of that nursing home got infected and several died um, because of that. So this was classic community spread. Uh, the belief is that person had traveled to China uh, for Chinese New Year, had come back and uh, uh, transmitted to uh, the patients there. Of course, we're not uh, the only country in the world and uh, other countries ha have it as well, but you can see that uh, generally speaking, um, the rates of rise have been fairly low. Uh, why New York is an epicenter is simply because, uh, number one, very large population. Number two, density of population where they are in very close uh, quarters, these very large high-rise buildings, people getting in and out of elevators, and it's impossible to practice social distancing unless you use the stairwells. Um, a lot of travel into the United States. And before Mr. Trump had closed all travel from China, it is estimated that there were 200,000 people who had flown in from Wuhan, China, uh, after the outbreak from December 2019 to the middle of March or when, early March when he closed the borders to China, uh, 200,000 people had flown in, some Chinese and some American, because a lot of business is conducted over there. Uh, this is from uh, April 17th, a couple of days ago, and uh, 2.1 million cases and 142,000 deaths. Mm. Uh, this is an international map, and you can see that the bigger the circle, the greater the density. And you can see that um, I heard the other day that the only, um, I think Barbados is something, the only country in the world that doesn't have it, everywhere in the world has it, 210 countries. Um, this is an interesting slide because if you look at the colors on the top, you'll see that uh, dark orange is faster and you can see um, the, the countries that have the most rapid spread, USA, Spain and Italy. Um, it's still unclear why Germany had such a high rate uh, occurrence with such a low death rate. It's not been explained to me adequately why that would be. This is just the state distribution and this is Florida here. Okay, The governor did not lock Florida down until the 3rd of April unclear why. This is New York up here with uh, most of the cases occurring in New York City uh, down here, this area here. This is Illinois, this is Michigan, this is Washington State, and this is California, and this is Texas. So the big centers in the United States of America with some places such as the Dakotas, North and South Dakota, having very low rates, 
probably largely related to very low population and low population density. This is an interesting slide to me because if you look at the bottom row, you'll see the total number of cases in the row above that are those that are under investigation. And it, the CDC is struggling to define why or how people have got this. Travel related, 6,800. And certainly that was the case in the very early stages of our COVID-19 experience. But now with no travel in or out of the United States, uh, it must be community contact. contact. So what about at Memorial Sloan Kettering? Um, so Memorial Sloan Kettering is one of 70 National Cancer Institute um, designated comprehensive cancer centers. Uh, we are routinely ranked number one or number two uh, cancer center in the United States every year. We have 498 beds. Uh, the hospital is a very well and uh, established hospital, 1884, when it opened and it resides on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. The first case in our hospital was a healthcare worker, which is on the 9th of February of this year. And since then, we've had more than 300 healthcare workers, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, and some other staff who have been infected. And the great news is that none of those have ended up dying at this point in time, and many of them have returned to work. Uh, the average COVID-19 census in the hospital on a daily basis is 110. So since starting, the average number of people in the hospital who have COVID-19 is 110. The average number being managed by intensive care staff is about 25, somewhere between 20 and 30. They are not all in the ICU. As I said, some of them are managed outside of the ICU uh, with high O2, um, non-rebreather masks, and proning. One of the things that we did very early on is that we canceled all elective surgery. Now, at a cancer center, what is elective and what is urgent and what's necessary is a very complicated thing. Okay, um, there are some cancers that um, probably can't wait. Some breast cancers, renal cell cancer, perhaps some bladder cancers. Most of the prostate cancer patients can wait unless they have very high grade prostate cancer. So all elective surgery was canceled. And there were two reasons for that. One was to limit the transmission to healthcare workers. But the second and very importantly was to allow us to free up beds in the hospital, especially ICU beds for ICU. And we went from having two ICUs to five ICUs, including the main um, uh, recovery room in, in the main operating was turned into an ICU. So we went from two to five ICUs. All non-urgent patient visits were canceled. And in my personal practice, we just canceled all patient visits. I haven't seen a patient face-to-face -face since um, the middle of February. Okay. And by the way, uh, one of my nurses had COVID. Two of my staff have been ill, but were COVID negative. So it's impacted dramatically upon my personnel and my practice. Um, so it's really important as you think about how you would respond to this in, in your country that you protect not just patients, but that you protect your healthcare workers. Because if you don't have enough nurses and doctors, who's going to staff the ventilators? That's right. Um, we have accepted patients from other institutions in the New York area. There are many hospitals in the New York area that are basically flooded and overwhelmed, and we've accepted their cancer patients, especially from those hospitals into our institution. And numerous employees, nurses, doctors, and other uh, administrative staff have been redeployed to other areas. Uh, we were all asked early on, where would you like to work if you were redeployed? ICU, emergency room, or on a medical surgical floor? And uh, Fortunately, to date, I have not yet been redeployed, but there are many surgeons who have. We've had a, a, a very distinct evolution in response. Literally, in the early stages, day by day, there were changes in policies. Literally, every 24 to 48 hours, there was a change in policy. Uh, who were testing, because there weren't enough tests, and then the availability and how PPE would be used. And I think that we, the institution would say that we probably, if we had enough PPE and we had enough tests, would have been testing every patient at the start and would have been making sure that every healthcare practitioner was wearing some mask from the very beginning. So we've had resource shortage issues, including personnel issues. And that's why some of our physicians and nurses have been redeployed to ICU and the emergency room. Now, all of our healthcare workers are mandated to wear a mask in the hospital setting as soon as they walk in, and they need to wear an N95 mask if they are in contact with somebody who's COVID-19 positive or somebody who's at high risk of COVID-19 positive or somebody who are suspicious has COVID-19 positivity. Um, so there are my slides uh, for the moment, Sally. So thank you so much. Very interesting, actually. It just show us how the story gets uh, unfolded in the States. Uh, 
Now I'll go to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lido. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Lido is 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 uh, a well-known andrologist and urologist, but at the same time he got experience with the infection itself. So, but uh, thanks God, uh, as he's always strong, he he could fight the infection, he overcome the infection. So it will be very interesting to us to hear from physician who got the infection. How did he? What was the experience that he got? What are the symptoms? How did it uh, start? What do you think the source for infection? Is it from contact of a relative or from the hospital itself? And at the same time, if you can just give us a short update about the situation in uh, in Spain. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, first of all, I would like to to thank to my good friend Sally uh, the invitation for me. It's an honor, and also uh, it's good to meet uh, John Mulhall. He is a very important authority in all these issues, not in COVID issue, obviously, but it is in sexual medicine. So, first of all, I would like to show, sorry, no, this is my disclosure. I am also not an expert in COVID-19, but I have been a urologist who has been sick by the virus. I think that uh, Professor Mulhall has said something that is common with the Spain. We have two risk factors for this disease, the virus itself and the politicians. I think that the politicians on each country is the second most important risk factors for all this disgusting situation. And we should probably, because this is a breakdown in the history of the last years, and probably in the next future when more or less normality comes back, we have to think about, especially the health providers, what should be our attitude uh, regarding our politicians. Because, at least in Spain, we think that sometimes they don't are able to take all the care that they should do about us, you know. So, this is the... Uh, I don't want to, to get angry, obviously. Uh, sorry, because I have been today in a sorrow act because a, a sergeant very good of mine has died this morning and the cause of the die was uh, coronavirus. So I am a little, a little sad. So this is the situation of our country of Spain in comparison to the rest of the world. As you see here, the rate, uh, comparative rate of confirmed cases is uh, almost 8.5. Uh, here is a bias because here in Spain, I don't know in uh, the United States, but here in Spain uh, only are taken into account those cases that are positive virus tests. So the, the conclusion is that probably this rate should be much more higher than that the rate that is declared officially. Uh, the number of casualties is over 20,000 today, that represents almost 13% in comparison to the rest of the world, and uh, the number of the rate of cure patients is around 13%, which is uh, over, sorry, 74,000, which is around 13% uh, in comparison to the rest of the world. So, uh, very important figures, as you can see. This is a map of the situation in Spain. Here in the first part of the slide, you can see how has been the profile of the outcomes of new cases of coronavirus in Spain. As you see here in the uh, graphics, you can draw two conclusions. The first one is that the moment of maximum incidence was more or less the end of the month of March. And now the second conclusion is that we seem to be in a, a smooth downward trend with some swings, we'll see. This is the uh, this map represents the coronavirus risk map this risk map uh, sorry distribution in Spain. As you can see, the two greatest number of cases uh, zones in Spain are the center of the country, where is Madrid, where I live and work, and uh, this is uh, reasonable because Madrid is the capital of the country 
And also the second part of the country, which is more effective, is uh, the region of Catalonia, where the capital is Barcelona, the second in importance city of the country. Which could be the possible reasons for this distribution? Probably the same as uh, John has said regarding New York. Barcelona and Madrid has the largest populations and also the large movement of people, flights, trains, high mobility of people. And as if you see here in this slide, until the weekend of the 8th, 9th of March, the movements of flights and trains were almost normal. People coming from everywhere. And obviously, this was a very important risk factor for what happened later. So how the country has dealt with the pandemic? I think that the way Spain is dealing with the pandemic is based in two important aspects. The first one is, and this is true, completely true, probably Spain, uh, as long as it's a smaller country than the States, is more, um, is more control, is more, I mean, controllable. And the first aspect is the maximum respect of the population for those confinements rules and the state of emergency that was decreed by the government of Spain on the evening of March 14th, Saturday. And second, that was a very quick and massive reorganization of the healthcare system, which was managed by the national government, but also by the local government of each region and the city councils. Here, here sorry, you can see what was the starting point of my city, of the city of Madrid, before starting with the coronavirus pandemic. So this is the usual situation. We have a system of health uh, based on two different systems, the private uh, health system and the, 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 and the public health system. The public health system is composed here in Madrid by 34 general hospitals with five highly complex centers, those that we call level three, nine centers of intermediate complexity, level two, and 21 monographic hospitals, support centers, and short-stay hospitals. At the same time, usually the private health system with a completely independent system of management offers 102 hospitals. But at the time that coronavirus pandemia started, and in a very quick decision, the management of both public and private health was converted into a single command in order to try to achieve a maximum efficiency. That means that all the resources of the private health care were converted into centers for COVID patients. That represented a really was done because everyone wanted to get a complete and effective a collaboration among both the public and private health system. Uh, also, additional measures uh, in order to deal with the pandemia was the transformation of the big hospitals. 90% of the resources of the large general and university hospitals in all the country were converted to COVID and very quick in just a few days. Different areas of the hospital, such as gyms, rehabilitation areas, libraries, became COVID areas. Globally, in Spain, in just 10 days, more or less, we moved from more than 4,400 ICUs beds to double, more than 8,422 ICUs beds. But the problem appeared, and we suffer a shortage of health personnel to manage the emergency. This situation forced to the management of the hospitals to allocate many specialists, surgical specialists that do not know nothing about COVID, also urologists, to those departments intended for the management and treatment of these patients with COVID-19. And also, not only the personnel, but also the departments, urological and other surgical specialization departments have been turned into medical departments in order to increase the number of potential beds. So the goal 
is to uh, convert all the resources of the hospital dedicated to these COVID patients. In parallel, some complementary measures have been taken, as in China, construction and organization of support new hospitals in a very quick time was developed. And for example, a large 1,500 bed hospitals with more than 100 ICU beds was organized and constructed in five days in the largest venue for congresses and exhibitions in Spain, which is located in Madrid, and is called IFER. Its organization was managed by the health authorities and executed by the Spanish army. In this project, additional hired staff, voluntaries, also retired doctors, medicine students have amplified the capacity of the hospitals and the support centers and have come, uh, have gone to different hospitals, public, private, and these complementary centers in order to help and to assist the usual staff. Also, additionally, a small and medium field hospitals have been built in social times as 48 hours by the collaboration of both the National Army and also non-governmental organizations with the participation of volunteers. And these centers have been installed on the perimeter of large hospitals as support centers. Also, the Army, the National Army, has supported those public services in tasks of disinfection and cleaning measures, support for the elderly population, among other also risk groups. However, we have faced uh, the same problems as in the, state, as in the states. So an exceeded demand, I prefer to say exceeded demand than lack, because lack is so disgusting that I prefer to say to talk about exceeded demand for individual protective equipment masks, filters, gowns, many health providers has been, uh, many of them, with mild symptoms but at home with no tests. And those people who were going to the hospital, um, they miss sometimes uh, abundancy in this individual protective equipment. So the problem is the same in many countries. Also, uh, in consequence, the increase, uh, and it's obvious that this uh, disease produces an increased risk of contagion with many infections recorded among those health workers. Uh, the spread of the disease among professionals is a big problem because professionals are not in lockdown. They are going every day to the hospital. For example, I have um, I have offered you here the data of my hospital, Gregorio Marañón, the local hospital rate of spread among our health professionals. We have a global infection rate of over 11%. The rate of physicians affected is more than 12%. Nurses and others, non-doctors, workers is around from 13 to 15%. And finally, those hospital non-patient direct contact professionals people who work in the kitchen, people who work in the, uh, sometimes in the safety uh, services of the hospital, 7.74. So this uh, is more or less a depiction of the situation in Spain. But my friend Sale asked me uh, to talk to you about my own experience. My own experience, God bless. Uh, has not been uh, very intense, has been, I could be, I could say, mild. I suffer, and this is my, my own experience, I, I started to suffer some varied and mild symptoms for 10 days. This was more or less three weeks ago. A moderate sensation of diarrhea, no fever, a mild sore throat, tiredness and muscle pain, also headache. I thought that it was just a flu, the excess of work, as you probably, we are working uh, every day for 10 hours, so we are really uh, tired and you can feel this sometimes. But strangely, progressively, I started to lose the smell and the taste of food. I started to feel lack of appetite and I lost three kilograms of weight. Finally, after days of hard work with these symptoms, I started to feel a rising temperature over 37 degrees and some slight respiratory distress when climbing stairs. 
I went to the hospital because I was a little scared and I was tested for the PCR for the virus. It was positive. Uh, the result was communicated to me in 48 hours and an X uh, ray of my chest was done and we could see some uh, slight uh, pulmonary infiltrate. I was offered, in fact, to stay at the hospital, to enter the, first, the hospital, but I have to uh, tell you that I prefer not to stay there. The fact of thinking about the stay at the hospital scared me and I prefer to come back to my home and isolate me. I didn't take any medication. Some colleagues of me, I have to tell you that in my department, we are 14 staff and 10 of us have been sick. So it's, as you can imagine, a high rate God bless, again, mild symptoms, all of them, but mm, 10 of 14, it's a very big rate, as you can imagine, as some colleagues of mine has, uh, have took some acetromycin and chloroquine. I was just taking paracetamol and I started a complete isolation from my family. My wife is also a physician, she is a psychiatrist. She has not been curiously infected, and she has been going to the hospital every day. And uh, he is, she is also PCR negative. And recently, yesterday, in fact, she was done the serology and the serology was negative. So she has not been in contact with the virus, curiously. I have two, uh, a 23 year old girl and a 18 year old boy, and they have not been infected too. They are studying hardly at home. All my activities were done alone, eat, obviously asleep, everything at all, with protection, mask, gloves, whatever. One week after starting with isolation, I started to feel much better. I was recovering the appetite. This was crazy for me. In Spain, you cannot lose the appetite, obviously. Also, I started to recover the smell, the taste. I didn't feel more fever. And 14 days after the first test, I was done the second PCR. It was negative. And just 48 hours later, I came back to the hospital. But I have to tell you, and with this sentence, I finish my, my presentation. Uh, now it's very curious, the post-COVID situation. And I think that we will see it in the future. Although I know that I am COVID negative with several antibodies present, and that's cured. I can swear you that I am much more worried when I go to the hospital and I take more precautions even than before getting infected. Maybe this is a post-disease fear. So this is my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Enrica. Um, and thanks, mm -hmm. God, for overcoming the infection. Now, this is, this is very true when it comes to healthcare workers. According to the last uh, statistics from the CDC, more than 9,000 healthcare workers have been tested positive for COVID-19 in the state as if uh, April 9, and, and the number is going up and up with time. So it's very important to get protected for yourself for your, and your, for, for your family. Uh, I would like also That's to right. draw attention to our colleagues here. If we are getting some questions that in, in a short time we'll go through them through the uh, WhatsApp and through the uh, uh, the email that was sent before, but if you have any any question that comes up related to the talk for today webinar, please type it in in the chat window, and we will be happy to accommodate your questions. Now, uh, now during the the time of the uh, lockdown, obviously everything is shut down, and that tremendously will affect your clinical practice, whether you do it for. Uh, for your private clinic or for your uh, uh, governmental job. And uh, this is the same situation all over the world. Uh, and it will be affected even if you open your practice because people will, will feel worried to come to your clinic, not because of you, because of the situation around the clinic. So the question that comes, and actually we are getting a lot of questions uh, in this regard, how to maintain your practice, how to maintain uh, they reach mm. out to your patient, and at the same time, you maintain your income. I'll direct this question first to uh, Dr. Mulhall. Uh, probably they have uh, a well-established telehealth in the state, and I would like to know how does it 
unfolded over the last uh, two months. Okay, so um, you can see my you can see my slide. Yep. Yeah, good. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about my practice. Um, I have a clinical team that consists of me, a clinical fellow who spends two years training with me after the completion of uh, residency. I have three nurse practitioners. Uh, I have a nurse. Uh, the nurse practitioners in our country can see patients uh, under my supervision, but independently of me. And they bill out about 80% of, uh, of what I bill. We have a psychologist and then we have support staff, three uh, staff members in the office, uh, running scheduling and then uh, three of them actually in clinic helping us one clinic i see patients two days a week the nurse practitioner see patients three days a week uh, last year we saw 4600 patient visits and we received 17,000 phone calls in 2019 and we do approximately 500 procedures a year office and operating room so this is a very busy practice medically and surgically so there are some practical considerations that we were forced into uh, when this thing happens. My uh, nurse practitioner uh, was ill on a Monday. I was not in clinic, but two of my other nurse practitioners were. Uh, she went home, she didn't come back. Uh, we wore masks on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. On Thursday, we found out she was positive. And uh, from then on, we stopped seeing patients. And this was uh, in February, middle of February. So everything changed dramatically from seeing patients face to face to no seeing patients face to face. Um, and fortunately, at this point in time, we have not had a case of priapism, um, which will be our biggest concern, and we have not had to go into the emergency room yet. Okay. So the first thing is, is uh, billing issues. Okay. So the hospital worked very quickly to establish the rules for billing. Those rules have changed a little bit over the last few weeks, but essentially we are now allowed bill for phone calls or for video. We have a law in the United States of America called the HIPAA law, which is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act, which is essentially confidentiality. So there were great concerns early on about is this confidential, can we do this, et cetera. Um, you can do a phone call or you can do a video. I will tell you that having started doing videos, I started with voice, uh, I prefer the videos. I like the ability to interact with the person face to face and see the expression on their face rather than just listening to them. Okay. The next very important consideration, and again, this was an evolution at Memorial, is do we use FaceTime? Not everyone has an iPhone, so they don't have FaceTime. Do we use WhatsApp? The problem with WhatsApp is that when you call people, your number will come up. Okay. So they will have your phone number, which is a concern to many clinicians, nurses, and doctors in the United States of America. The institution then started using Cisco Jabber but there were tremendous concerns among the faculty that the video component of that wasn't working. And what we're using now is we're using Doximity. Now, I don't know if Doximity works in Saudi Arabia. Doximity is an app which you can download. And it was a, a Doximity Dialer as part of the, the program. And what it does is it blocks your number and it makes your number look like you're calling from your office. So the patient gets a phone call, it has your office number come up, and your personal number does not come up. Very quickly after the start of this crisis, Doximity developed video software, where basically you just now click on video call, the patient gets a text message, so it has to be done on a cell phone. Text message, and they click on the, uh, the link, and it puts them into the chat room with me or my fellow or my nurses, okay? So we are now exclusively using Doximity video caller. And that is what I would recommend you do if you have it uh, uh, available in Saudi Arabia. When we set patients up for appointments, the billing regulations in America say that they have to be consented to have a phone call or a video call before we can bill them. Okay, so they fill out a consent uh, on our portal system, our online portal system in the hospital. But I start off every phone call telling the patient, do I have permission? to speak to you or watch you on video and conduct this consultation and you're aware that your insurance company will be billed for this or you will be billed for this. I think video is more functional as I've said. If you're having partners uh, being present, which of course in sexual medicine I'm a big fan of, 
um, we would recommend that you make sure that the patient is aware that the partner is present in the same room as the patient. We've had a few patients who have uh, were on video and they have their cell phone and their partner's on their cell phone um, uh, speaker phone. And it's very difficult to hear and it slows everything down and the communication is complicated. So, Mr. Jones, yes, we'll have a video call. You can have your wife present as long as she's in the same room. Okay. Um, uh, you are probably not going to experience this, but in America, we have uh, large groups of people who don't speak English properly and they would, in an in office visit, have a translator. And we do not allow translator patients uh, to be done by phone call or video. It's just way too complicated and you spend most of the time just waiting for the translation to be done. <clears throat> we now schedule our <clears throat> video conferences uh, with our patients uh, just like we do in a regular clinic. It's me and my fellow who uh, run, run the schedule. And every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we're not operating, we're not doing office procedures. Every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, we have uh, phone clinics, video clinics from nine o'clock in the morning to about four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, and it actually has worked out very, very well. And almost every patient, 95 plus percent of the patients are very happy with how we are doing this. Okay, obviously the big issue is that we can't examine them. Okay, but we certainly can get a lot of information from them. Documentation wise, I use the same form that I did in the office. I use the same form at home. Okay, and they, the forms are emailed to me. I print them out and they're paper forms and I just fill them out. I take the history and I document things identically as to what I would do in the office in a face-to-face -face visit. And I would recommend you do that. Uh, there's some Peyronie's disease considerations. Um, patients can uh, upload to our portal system photographs of their curvature. I'm not a big fan of photographs, to be honest with you. And every new Peyronie's disease patient in my practice will eventually get a curvature assessment in the office with a duplex Doppler ultrasound. But they can send us photographs, which we can look at. I know of some authorities in Peyronie's disease in America who are having people on video um, get an erection and show the a surgeon what their penis looks like. Um, I'm always concerned about the rigidity and whether the curvature you see on video is actually representative of their real curvature. So there are the practical considerations, uh, Saleh, in, in my practice. Great. We got a couple of questions here from audience, and one of the questions that came up uh, is uh, which platform that you would recommend uh, to use? Now, let me just give you one hint about the situation in Saudi here, because uh, telehealth is not very well established because of previous regulations. And over the last one month, the Ministry of Health have updated the regulations and they are permitting now uh, telehealth or telemedicine, uh, and they are asking the insurance even company to cover for, uh, for the visit. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, it was before, it was mandated by the Ministry of Health for, for the consultation to happen. It has to be physically present in the clinic. Now you can do it even from home and you can prescribe even from home. So the question that comes up, what, what should be the secure uh, platform uh, that's usually affordable. People have uh, questioned the utility of uh, Skype or Zoom or FaceTime and this. How practical and secure you think it is for uh, for utilizing as a platform for telehealth? So our institution, which have done the security assessment, do not allow us to use FaceTime or WhatsApp or Skype. And there are patient confidentiality issues, but there's also clinician confidentiality issues because they will they will uh, give the patients a link to you. They will get inf personal information, your phone, your Skype name, etc. And so that's why they moved to Cisco Jabber, J-A-B-B-E-R, um, which some physicians have been unhappy with because of the um, video links. Um, it's very good for phone, um, but we now move to Doximity, and Doximity is completely and absolutely secure both for patients and for the clinician. Um, it just uh, in response to what you said about the government changing and the regulations, uh, the government regulations in America changed also and very rapidly they allowed telemedicine to be built. Um, there are great concerns about the economy uh, going into a, a recession, which I imagine it will, but that includes healthcare. 
Um, so I have to say the government in this regard and the insurance companies in this regard, uh, who are usually not the doctor's friends in America, but they were very quick to support telemedicine. So is, is everything covered by the billing, whether it is a, a video uh, visit or just a phone visit or sometimes just only by texting, by, yeah. by messages? In, in, my, in the USA, I'll be interested to see what Enrique says, but in, in USA, texting is not covered. Um, I will tell you that video consultation, uh, you will make three times as much money in America as you will by just doing a phone call. But the amount you get even for video consultation is about half what you would get if you did a face-to-face -face consultation. So while they are approved and they're billable and you, you can re, re, uh, get the money, you recoup the money, uh, the charges are much smaller. One question here comes up, uh, is the phone consultation built the same whether you spend with the patient five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour? Yeah, so it's very easy in America because there are um, uh, basically uh, time uh, criteria for the levels. Um, level one, two, and three, so uh, less than 15 minutes is level one, um, uh, 15 to 24 minutes is level two, and over 24 minutes is level three. And they're the three levels that you can bill for a voice, consult, a voice or a video consultation. And you have to document consent was given for consultation and billing, and you have to document the time. And to get uh, to get built for, for the visit, do you need to be physically in your clinic or you can do it from home? No, I, I honestly, I have been in complete isolation for four weeks. I go to the grocery store for 30 minutes every week and I go to the office to collect charts and things I have to do in the office for 30 minutes. I haven't stepped in the hospital in four weeks. So everything is done from home. Great. The one question here the people are asking about, do you need to record the, the, uh, the consultation just for medical legal purposes? No, and I, I, I no is the answer. And I expect that that would be, um, we don't record our face-to-face -face visits. The documentation is whatever is written down on the paper form or the electronic form, depending on what electronic medical record you have. Um, I am practicing and, and this is one of the things for the future, I think we can do in the future, and again, I'll be interested in what Enrique says, I think we can do a lot of medicine, sexual medicine, uh, by telemedicine in the future. Um, you get a man who comes in with premature ejaculation or something, well, what do we need to examine him for? It's nearly always negative. Um, and like, likewise with many men with ED, maybe the low testosterone patient, the Peyronie's patient, but there's a lot that we can accomplish by telemedicine. And we've learned that over the last four weeks. Well, I guess it will be very easy for you to, to utilize the service for returning patients because you already know the history and you have the record and physical examination have been done before. But the problem when it comes for the first visit for the new patients. So is it is it legal to just ask the patient to show you up some, some part of his body when, for example, inspection to the genitalia, if he's mentioning that I got a swelling or something or a penile curve, is it something acceptable? Yes. Um, so again, um, if you're having a video consultation and you anticipate the person demonstrating something physically, you need to ask consent for that. Do I have your permission to speak to you and, and look at you, whatever you want to show me today, and you just need to document that. And as long as it's documented in the, in the records, it's, it's okay. Great. And, uh, and just one more question here when it comes to uh, telehealth. Uh, can you bill for uh, just supervising a procedure done in the hospital while you are at home? <laughs> at not watching. at Memorial Sloan Kettering at the moment. Not at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, no. Is it something practiced in the state? Um, I don't believe so. I think if you're billing somebody, so Medicare, which is the governmental insurance, uh, all of the other insurance companies model their plans after Medicare. And Medicare requires, if you're doing a major procedure, so let's say you were doing a radical prostatectomy or penile implant surgery, that you have to be present for the entire procedure. Right, you have to be present for the major components of the operation. So you could have a, a trainee or somebody else start and maybe finish, but if, say, you were doing an implant, the major portions would be um, dilation of the corporal bodies, insertion of the implant, et cetera. 
If you're doing a minor procedure, let's say an intralesional xiaflex, or if you're doing a duplex ultrasound or a cystoscopy as a general urologist, you have to be present for the entire procedure. So you have to be physically present for the major parts of a major operation and for all of, all of the minor procedures in America. What about consultation between uh, two consultants about a case like interprofessional consultation? Did you get billed for that? No, there is no there is no bill for that unless it happened to be a medical legal case in which uh, there would be a there would be a charge for that. But if I have a patient and I want to call Dr. Goldstein or Dr. Liu, um, then that would not be billed. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so I, I, I have, I have, I think one or two more slides. I forgot about the my surgical practice. So, uh, can you still see my slides? This won't take very long. No, no, can no. Still... Can we can we bring up uh, Dr. Malal's slides, please? Yeah. Um, so, um, so um, intubation causes aerosolization, uh, and remember that twenty five percent of uh, COVID negative patients are asymptomatic and plus asymptomatic patients who have been operated on with general anesthesia who get pneumonia post-op uh, can get very sick. So there's a good argument not to be doing procedures that don't need to be done. Now, as you know, we have patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering who have 20 centimeter renal tumors who need an operation uh, and they get done. So renal cancer before bladder cancer before prostate cancer but in my practice, I have canceled all penile implant and peyronie's disease operations uh, as soon as we canceled the, the clinics. Uh, some urologists were doing implant surgery up until recently. Um, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America has looked down upon that. We see no reason why uh, somebody needs to do these operations uh, in this crisis. Uh, some urologists are still doing intralesional Xiaflex and Testafel office procedures, and I would consider that um, not a great idea. I think you're exposing patients to risk, yourself to risk, and your staff to risk, and then anyone, if you get infected, anyone you come in contact with outside of the hospital. We have done two pre-chemotherapy sperm extraction procedures. Uh, the pediatric case was done under general anesthesia, but the adult case, which is usually done under general anesthesia, we did under local spermatic cord block and uh, intravenous propofol, so that we would limit the risk of aerosolization, and we minimize the number of pay, uh, working staff who are actually in the operating room at the same time as the procedure, especially for the intubated patient. Um, from a face mask standpoint, um, you've got N95s on the top left, and you've got the, the, um, the uh, cloth masks on the right. Um, if you look at what literature there exists, and it's not great, you will see that cloth masks will reduce the distance that your aerosol, when talking or speaking or breathing, the, the distance the aerosol goes will be reduced. And if somebody is, aeros is creating an aerosol um, uh, in, in your face, then cloth masks may help that. But remember, the viral particle is 0 0.01 millimeter, and N95 masks have a, a pore that is 0 0.3 millimeters. So much more effective at prevent preventing the droplet nuclei being, uh, being inhaled. Um, and there is this uh, research, this is published in the New England Journal uh, in the middle of April, uh, surface stability, about how it shows that it exists on surfaces, steel and plastic, longer than on wood or cardboard for up to 72 hours. Therapeutic strategies, of course, revolve around ventilatory support, high O2, ventilation with high level PEEP, ECMO, nitric oxide potentially, and then the proning concept. Uh, if you look at the therapeutic strategies as drugs, you have to be very, very careful about how you look at data. For the vast majority of studies that have been done so far, some of which have been published, these are desperation maneuvers. These are typically done in men who are or patients who are sick. Okay, That is not the same as a well-conducted randomized controlled trial. And there's been a rift uh, in America between uh, the president who is, has been advocating chloroquine, why not? Well, except that chloroquine has caused some myocardial um, uh, adverse effects in some patients. And the medical community, the director of the, um, uh, the CDC and the NIH, Dr. Fauci, who has come out and said, let's wait for more data. Emerging pharmacotherapy, chloroquine as an anti-malarial, uh, has some antiviral properties. 
probably the agent that appears to have the most promise is remdesivir, which is an inhibitor of RNA synthetase, which was used successfully in the um, original SARS, uh, or this group of drugs was used successfully in the original SARS outbreak in 2003. Lopinavir and metonavir is a combination of protease inhibitors um, which are being studied. Abadol is a broad spectrum antiviral. Antibody rich plasma transfusion again has to be used in, in desperation situations. Stem cells, there are four Chinese research trials ongoing, and then there are at least four candidates for vaccines in development. But anyone we speak to at Memorial will tell us that it's probably going to be the end of 2020, early 2021, before we have a reliable vaccine. Uh, this is a, a paper published in, um, uh, on Rendesivir in uh, the New England Journal, and you'll see the word compassionate use appears in there. Okay, so this is a desperation maneuver, and it is true that in, I can't remember how many patients, I think there was maybe um, 18 patients, that there was a significant group of men who had reduction in their oxygen requirements, no doubt. Okay, now this is the WHO Sol Solidarity Project. This is a project that is um, answer, aiming to answer uh, looking in different 10 different countries with different drugs um, to give rapid insights into the following questions. Do any of the drugs reduce mortality? Of course, that'll be the first question. Do any of the drugs reduce the time a patient is hospitalized? Do the treatments affect the need for people with COVID-19 induced pneumonia to be ventilated or maintained? Does it reduce the necessity for them being ventilated? Could such drugs be used to minimize the illness of COVID-19 infection in healthcare staff and people at high risk of developing severe illness. So we will have data. It's not gonna be in the near future, but we will have data in this regard on as some of these drugs that I outlined. And that is my last slide, Sally. I apologize. Thank you so much. I'll go to uh, Dr. Enrique now. Uh, and the questions that uh, is coming up, first of all, if you have anything to add when it comes to uh, uh, telehealth or telemedicine with your patients. If there is anything else uh, I've been practiced in the Spain compared to the state. And the second question yes. also comes honest. from, mm -hmm. when you go back to, to your practice, uh, when you start operating again, uh, whether next week or the week after, mm -hmm. whatever it's, it's possible in your country, what are the measures that you will do mm -hmm. to protect yourself and minimize the risk mm -hmm. of infection for you and your uh, colleagues? Uh, and in that regard, people are asking, does the, the virus uh, get fitted through the, the urine or the semen? Hmm. Hmm. Well, if you want, I can uh, try to present you very quick some slides about the, which has been our practice this time and how is uh, supposed to be scheduled this is uh, not for sure, but we have to suppose that in the next two, three weeks, uh, things may change very quick. This is uh, recent from yesterday, uh, EAU Guidelines Office, a Rapid Reaction Group, an organization, a classification of the rate of priority of the patients. Uh, the EAU uh, sent this uh, mail dividing the patients in emergency patients, high priority, uh, those patients that you can uh, that you have to treat before six weeks, intermediate priority with three months of limit and low priority over six months. This, this could be applied, this low priority probably to all the andrology uh, patients. Sorry. This is, so uh, I would like to, to, to uh, present you this data because this is the way we have maintained our practice during the lockdown. In these first slides, from the point of view of the public health system, that means how as urology department in a general university hospital uh, situation has been managed. I have divided the situation in this first, this is the acute phase, what I would I call acute phase. Uh, the main point is that all the urology department beds were reconverted to COVID patients. We started to do telemedicine consultation, but we only used telephone contact. No video, no WhatsApp, only telephone contact with the patient, no face-to-face, -face, just in the emergency patients. All the surgeries, elective surgeries were canceled only emergency and high priority oncological surgeries were performed 
with a PCR test completed 24 hours before the surgery. Uh, I think that Professor Murhal is going to talk us something about this, but uh, recently has published that those PCR negative uh, patients, uh, PCR positive, but patients that have not been PCR before the surgery and are operated have a high rate of complications, pneumonia and death. So it's better and, and, and recommended to complete the PCR test 24 hours before the surgery, and if it's posit positive, to cancel the procedure. And from the point of view of diagnostic acts, only please complete those acts that are really of high risk patients. I mean, some cystoscopies in patients with very big macroscopic hematuria, if you think that to complete the cystoscopy uh, may uh, be followed by the surgery of an important tumor. If this is not the situation, don't do it. Um, the second phase, the clean phase, we, est we are going to start next week. Next week, as you have seen before, the slope tends to drop down very smoothly. And this Monday starts a period of reconversion again of the urology department beds from COVID patients to urology patients. This process is supposed to take around seven to 10 days, we have to create potentially disinfected areas, isolated completely from COVID areas, beds, offices to visit our patients. We have to keep on using masks, gloves, gowns, and we have to try to get all the staff COVID PCR negative and seroconverted, and no staff positive should contact with patients COVID or not COVID. We keep on doing telemedicine consultation. Our patient clinic is maintained only by telephone contact in this second phase, no face to face. We keep on doing emergency patients and we keep also on only emergency and high risk procedures, surgeries with PCR tests 24 hours before the surgery. Regarding the private practice, remember that in Spain we have the public practice and the uh, private practice. Pra private practice tends to be in a smaller centers, not so complex centers. In the acute phase, uh, these last two, three weeks, we have done telemedicine consultation, no outpatient clinic, only by telephone, no face to face. We kept on emergency patients. We have we maintained the on call and we go to the hospital. We have obviously an emergency situation only emergency surgeries, no other types of surgeries, and the same for the diagnostic acts. In relation to the next week, we start also in private practice a phase two. In this setting, the doctor is theoretically cured and immunized. Thus, the doctor become, uh, if the doctor, and this is just a suggestion, if the doctor during these past weeks have become mildly infected, Probably this situation has been advantageous for the next phase, for the next week, next weeks. We are going to maintain on telemedicine consultation, but we are going to start in the setting of a doctor that has passed the infection and is immunized. We are going to start with the outpatient clinic, obviously maintaining some protection rules, gloves, gowns, masks, no partner with the patient, and to maintain a safety distance of minimum two meters. We maintain, if the patient prefer direct telephone contact, especially older patients prefer not to go to the hospital, we maintain obviously the activity with emergency and regarding the surgeries, only emergency and again high risk patients, but in this case, not only oncological, also non-oncological, those procedures not recommended to be deferred and always short stay procedures, same day discharge or one day discharge with no need of ICU and obviously with the completion of the preoperative PCR. Regarding the next, maybe after two weeks, what we could say or what we could call transition phase to be, the doctor, more and more doctors are cured and immunized we keep on the telemedicine consultation, the same uh, way of doing things as in the previous phase, 
also direct telephone, also emergency patients in the setting of surgeries as soon as the intensive care units see the pressure reduce and some beds of these intensive care units are going to be released, height and intermediate risk are going to be considered to be uh, operated. So this increases the possibilities. What happens with what we call phase three? That means the slow normalization of the surgical activity and the possibility of doing also intermediate and low priority ca cases, we have no idea. Maybe it's going to happen in, what, in two months, three months. We are not sure, obviously. What happens with the andrology, male functional, reconstructive urology potential problems? Most of them are both intermediate and low priority procedures. These are non life threatening diseases, but with a high prevalence in the general population. Thus, what happens with these patients? Consequences in quality of life and discomfort for these guys who have to wait several months, those peyronie disease patients, those penile prosthesis candidates, also the reconstructive surgeries, urethroplasties, incontinence, BPH. It's obvious that these patients may be postponed. And this is not a fact that we may criticize. For example, in places like the States, like the Spain or in Italy, where nowadays we have suffered more than 20,000 casualties, it's obvious. But also the real situation, in my opinion, is that the decision making process in the end will depend on the local control of the infectious outbreak and the structure of each country, city and place. We may consider treating intermediate and low priority patients Obviously, you can do it, but only if the local situation is improving and changing. Obviously, we should look for solutions that also cure these patients. These patients, obviously, has the right to be treated, but at the same time, we have to protect the global security, and that's obvious. What is the proposal or just the speculating? Pues, to create in the next uh, future some clean areas with highly demanding and protocolized security check processes, only performing short stay surgeries, probably the, uh, this breakdown of the pandemic is going to change our practice. And those procedures that in the past had the patient at the hospital, maybe one, two days, are going to change to same day discharge. Why not? penile prosthesis, corporoplasties, BPH ambulatory treatments, they are going to turn uh, out to be just in one day state hospitals. In the end, and this is my first, my last slide, and I have to clarify you that this slide is more applicable to the Spanish situation where most of the patients are treated in the public health care system with no expenses for them. Are we going to get legal problems? Obviously, yes. Obviously, yes. And probably we will have in the future some suits because of COVID infections, because of, of other troubles, some situations that nowadays with all the confusion are happening. But patient must be extensively informed and information about the rate, about the risk of infection has to be written in the medical records. Are we going to have ethical problems? Well, overall, the main goal for us as health providers is to overcome and safely treat patients. This is our more urgent goal. Are we going to have epidemiological problems? Obviously, postoperative complications are higher in those unknown PCR positive surgical patients. It's better that we only treat surgically those patients that are PCR and are immunized. This is going to decrease the postoperative comorbidity. Are we going to have a strategic problems? Here in Spain, this is obvious. Why? Because as long as most of our patients are not paying for the treatment, not all patients in Spain are capable to pay money for a surgery. Those patients that must wait until the usual activity come back in the public hospital are going to, to accumulate. And this is going to trigger an economic problem. 
This is absolutely true. These patients that are accumulating in the public health assistance will be, if they come to the private practice to be operated, because they are incontinent, because they have a BPH, because they want a penal prosthesis, are going to be asked for a substantial outlay to access their surgical care. And this probably is going to represent a problem. And this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's uh, very clear indeed uh, and very informative. And uh, actually, we're getting a lot of questions. Most of it have been already answered through the presentation by both of you. Some of the questions are outside the scope of uh, today meeting. And the remaining part of the question, just for the sake of time, for the time of our speakers, will be answered and sent to your email uh, with the with the uh, after the webinar email that we are sending to you. Can I have my uh, closing slides, please? Can you show up my slides, uh, Mahmoud? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is only for people who would like to get more insight, more information about how to organize their uh, uh, clinical practice. This guidelines from AEU have been released yesterday, and it's very comprehensive and categorizing the patient according to different categories and giving you clear, uh, uh, clear classification and the guidelines when to operate and how to protect yourself. Similarly, from the American College of Surgeons, there are similar guidelines for triaging your patient and making a decision when to operate. And finally, this is the AUA Telehealth Webinar and Informatic Resources. It's in the AUA website. It contains a tremendous amount of resources, how to build up a telehealth, how to establish a new unit in your hospital or clinic. And I think it's very worthwhile if somebody would like to get more information to go and visit those sites. Thank you again for our panelists. Uh, very informative, uh, uh, and it targets the goal that we would like to deliver to our attendees. I'm very happy we have uh, attendees from, actually, it is not local, it's global now. We have more than 230 attendees. We got questions from Canada, from Colombia, from UK, and uh, a lot of questions also from Saudi and from Kuwait. Uh, so I would like to thank them for giving us the, the trust and honoring us by attending to the webinar. Uh, I would like also to conclude by thanking Tabuk Pharmaceuticals for their unrestricted support to have this meeting happening, and in particular, Dr. Baghdadi and Dr. Mahmoud Shawqi uh, for their tremendous effort and, uh, and uh, support uh, from the uh, technical point of view and from the preparation point of view to get this uh, a reality. Thank you again for our two speakers, and we hope we have another meeting in the near future in a better situation. Final talk for uh, for you, John, and one for you, uh, Enrique. Um, uh, just uh, be safe, um, uh, protect yourselves, and uh, stay healthy yourself. You're no use to your patients if you're not healthy. So uh, follow the precautions. Thank you, Jeff. I agree with John. Uh, just please take care. This is not a joke. I pay attention to the indications of your authorities. And I want to um, thank to Saleh, my friend Saleh, to thank to also Professor Mulka and say in the end, taking advantage that we have a lot of people from all over the world, that God bless humanity. That's the most important. Thank you. We, at this moment, we come to conclusion. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>